I've never played with a drummer like Sebastian. His sense of rhythm is very particular and very unique. Uh, and sometimes it feels, sometimes it's really uh, quite, there's some elements of his rhythm, rhythmic sensibility that are quite alien to me. And that's really where the fun stuff happens. A lot of things start with the beat, you know. John likes to have a beat, for sure. And Seb's got nothing but good beats, you know. <laughs> so that works out rather well to start there. Would you say Seb has all the best beats? Seb has some of the best beats, yes. So Seb has all the best beats. He has all the best beats of 2018. He, he exhausted the world of beats in 2018. He discovered Vinnie Caliuta, you know, so that changes a lot. It can be helpful when we start to write an album to come up with some key phrases that we like to hang our hat on at the end of the day, and they almost never really stick very long, but I think one of the, one of the very early conversations that, that we had, uh, which was, uh, I believe it was, no, I'm positive it was Seb who came up with the idea of us writing a hypnotic, groove-based record. If we're gonna call this record hypnotic, and if we're gonna call it groovy, we really need to stretch our imaginations on what those words mean because I, I the <laughs> hypnosis is more akin to psychosis for me in this one and the, yeah the grooves the grooves are there but they are intense grooves they are sometimes far more complicated than they appear to be I think with purple I was a little more concerned with the, the legacy of the previous albums and of how Alan plays and I was trying to sort of, you know, sort of marry my style and Alan's style and make a combination. And I still, I mean, it's still a little bit like that. I understand that this is a band that has a history and I don't want to totally rewrite it. But this time around, I was like, you know what? I'm going to play some like classic Seb grooves this time, <laughs> you know? And just force my way in and see how it turns out. And I think it turned out, turned out pretty well. If there's any uh, old Trans Am fans, there are a couple of, you might recognize a couple of things here and there. Me and Seb spent a lot of time talking and conceptualizing what we wanted the rhythm section role to be on this record. One thing that we did is we, uh, maybe we've already talked about this, but we kind of snuck in sort of the, some of the proggy elements. Like I think there's certain drum beats that when you listen to them, they sound totally normal. But if you're a drummer and you sit down and you try to play along, that's when you realize, wait a minute, something weird is happening here. This isn't actually what I thought it was. I think that's a good thing to not make it sound uncomfortable for a casual listener. And then as you sort of investigate it more, you realize, oh, wait a minute, this actually isn't a 4-4. I thought it was, you know? Things like that I think are cool. But as far as, as, far as recording techniques, I mean, there wasn't anything totally radical that we did. I don't know, as far as I can remember. There were some weird setups I used. There's one song where I do kind of, I'm faking a double kick thing between a giant rag tom and the, and the kick drum. So I had that on the snare side, the giant rag tom, and then I had roto toms. So it was, everything was a little bit backwards and it looked really weird, but it ended up being very ergonomic and it sounded pretty cool. That was on Seasons. It's doing like the, the, the sort of like galloping 6 8 section. Nick and Seb, they're just this dynamic duo as a rhythm section. Like they're out of control. And like the thing that the two of them share really like allowed for a lot of spontaneity to happen on the record. Like the end of um, Borderlines, how the song stops and then they come back in with this like drum and bass groove like that just happened really organically in the studio 
And that's the take that we kept. Like all the little changes and nuances in that ending section is just Nick and Seb making eye contact and almost like initially like half joking, like, oh, we're gonna keep, keep this groove going, but then settling into it and be like, oh, this is actually cool. And then like the way they change it up and you know, and then it's just me and John like, ooh, our pedals, like, <laughs> what can we contribute to this, uh, this like spontaneous thing that just happened? And I think that's really cool to have on a record. I didn't know if that was something we would keep or, or what we were doing in the moment, but then going back in the control room and like listening to that, it was like, oh my God, that was so, like such a magical thing, I don't know. The way they drive each other eventually becomes the way that they synchronize with one another. And it's, it's, it's just like really weird to watch the, the moment of like Nick, you know, playing some sick groove and Seb trying to, you know, trying to match it and then outdo it and then that drives Nick to improve what he's doing and then eventually they lock in and they're just, they're one thing providing the, the groove and the rhythm in the pocket and it's like, I know Gene and I would sometimes just be sitting on the other side of the room and when it locked, when it settled in, we're just like, what are you doing? <laughs> is that, is there a one in this beat? Canoscura was like the product of um, Nick and Seb wanting to have this like subterranean like cave person vibe and uh, Seb had this like paradiddle rhythm thing worked out that Nick wrote uh, like you know like a matching bass line to like all, all of the hits and everything and that was like a jam that we were working on in John's basement kind of just started out for fun and I think at one point we were trying to make can and pale sun like one song we were trying to like explore that for a while and then i remember driving up to uh to tarbox with john and we were like listening to like whatever like neurosis and motorhead and like we decided to put on some of the demos from john's basement uh that like stuff we were going to try to tackle while we were going up for the second session in the studio and we put on can of Skira and like, me and John were just like, what are we gonna do with this? Like, what is this song? Like, <laughs> but I don't know, Nick and Seb just like, we're having so much fun with it and we were able to kind of uh, use it and take a melodic motif from another song from Borderlines and layer it over top of uh, like that groove that they came up with. And yeah, it's like totally like sick, weird moment on the record and it's like, cool that's what a like wonderful thing to capture <laughs> can obscura um that's just the a dark brooding bass and drum workout that made it on the record you know we i think that's like that's us in the deep cave of the winter that we wrote this thing you know like that's like us in the depths of that and just part of like the psychedelic nature of of this record you know i think it like climaxes there at this really like really creepy moment on the record that is like definitely different than anything i've heard come out of us you know it's pretty yeah i, I really love that song or that moment Canoscura, um, paradiddle permutations. I think when we, when we recorded Can, we convinced ourselves that we were all in a cult. And we play solos with ebos and slide guitars and we're all chanting and hitting gongs and stuff, it's crazy. Seasons was, uh, really unique because Nick had this specific bass line and I think Seb already had a groove idea for that going in like going into it and I remember trying to figure out like what I was supposed to play in the first half of the song and I just had this like really weird like kind of swelly delay patch 
And I was trying to build some kind of like riff using this specific delay, but I very quickly realized that the most effective thing I could do is just play one note <laughs> and let the delay kind of just like swell and, and do its thing and like carry through the first verse. It's like a lot of stuff like that, like in my head as a guitar player, I'm like, what sick riff can I put here? And then it's like, oh, actually, I think just this one note is gonna suffice. <laughs> Angry the police, and by that I mean the band. Seasons was a, is a great example of John's vocals and John's lyrics saving a song. Musically, we were all like, what the hell is this? Is this work? We have to get rid of this, right? We can't have this on the record. This makes no sense. And then John wrote a melody to it. We're like, oh, okay, sweet. I love this song. Sick song. That's, that one, everybody thought that was the craziest song we wrote. Now everybody thinks it's the best song that we wrote on that record. Maybe everybody. I was playing the blast beat kind of like as a joke at first, you know? But maybe that's sometimes when musicians do that, they're sort of testing the waters. You know, you're, th you're throwing a lick, maybe <clears throat> as a joke, but actually somewhere inside you're like, I hope they like it, maybe, maybe we'll use it, right? So I think there's a bit of that going on. 